Okay, so welcome. This is the last session of the day. Um, thank you for making it through to the, to the bitter end. Um, this is a talk about immutable FreeBSD, and I think all of us have dealt with enough operating systems to know that this is a lie, this is a goal, it's aspirational, it's not achievable, um, but we made some progress. Um, and immutable means not subject to or susceptible to change. Um, so this is really coming from two different perspectives, one of which is the perspective of a service that's sitting on the internet, the less attack surface there is, the less problems we have, and the other one is from the um, operational perspective. If it's read-only, I probably won't have to fix it, and I like that. I like systems that don't wake me up at night uh, and then don't give me work to do in the morning. So I'm DCH. Um, I'm a professional yak herder, automator of things. If this sounds like something your company wants or needs, um, ask me questions after the talk. Okay? Um, the slides, the link here again is down at the bottom. This one's the PDF version. I don't think the blue is very readable either, sorry. Good. Okay. So the enemy of the state, the enemy is the state. If um, we have a service that has state, uh, a database, um, a web server with cookies, those are the things which make um, our world hard to manage. And so um, it's much easier to do this if you have control over the entire stack from the operating system, your middleware and databases and applications. But that's, that's what we want to get to. We want to eliminate the state. And I have a phrase, a long-term phrase, idempotent, repeatable, composable, and, and loosely coupled. And this is, I guess, 20, 30 years of learnings. Um, idempotent, I can run the job again and again and again, and I should get the same result. Um, repeatable, I shouldn't have to run the job all the time, but if I do, um, it should work the same way. Composable, um, it's important to have clear separations between our components so that we can replace a web server, a proxy server, change databases, um, change hosting providers even, without things breaking. And so through this talk, we've got a couple of points where um, I suppose I give my 10 cents of where I think uh, it's a good place to break in these services. And we definitely want to minimize operational tooling and effort. Personally, I've worked in really two types of organizations, ones that are very small where the total team is less than five, and larger organizations where there's maybe five continents involved and there seems to be nothing in between. Um, and in both of those cases, it's really important that um, the team that's doing operational work or application work can do their stuff without getting in the way of everyone else. Okay, so that's what we're focusing on. How can we minimize the, the long-term effort and do the, up, do the work at the beginning when the application's being built? Um, so, Anytime there's a red slide, you're welcome to ask questions. If it's not a red slide, you can wait a little bit and there'll be a red slide coming up real soon, I promise, okay? Um, there's two sponsors down the bottom, Clara Systems and uh, Juniper Networks. So some of the things we used in the talk were either built at Clara or built um, with Juniper, Juniper Networks. And I'll mention those in more detail, detail at the end, but thanks very much for, uh, for giving back to open source. That's why we're here. So first bit is the plumbing. I start from the plumbing, the networking, because it's the bit that I'm least familiar with, and so it's the bit that I wanted to offload as early as possible to somebody else, okay? Um, the context for this structure is that we have um, global services, and we want customers to be able to reach the closest server, and that should happen automatically without our, invention, without our intervention. Um, we should be able to take a, a continent out, or a cluster out, or a server out, and have the network do the needful to make everything just work. Um, and the first couple of times, I don't think we got it right. And now I think we still haven't got it right, but it's a lot better, yeah? So the very first version of this was um, using CARP failover on servers. Um, so that's really like an Ethernet um, IP layer failover. And the main feedback I got from that from the operators at a time was, we don't understand this stuff. It's too low level, it's too confusing. And what would happen is we would reboot service for patching, um, CARP would come up, services would fail over immediately, but the application hadn't booted. And so the main change we made in this area was stop using CARP and switch to um, BGP. Not BGP externally, but BGP within our networks. 
And the main advantage for that for us was that VGP then became just another service that the operators could start and stop and automate just like they would an application or, or a container. Um, and I guess since we put that in uh, 2017, um, that's the last I heard of it. So no one knows it's there, it just works. And that's the way technology should be. Um, so people come in from the outside and we have Anycast and that directs them to the nearest point of presence. Um, we tried using GeoDNS and in some cases that's really nice. Um, we can have health checks built into our DNS queries and that also has really nice fast convergence but um, I haven't changed over to that and maybe we never will. So three global regions, traffic comes through um, Anycast and then hits one of these regions and it hits our ISP's router first up. And the ISP router then has um, a list of announced BGP routes from inside the network and it's receiving these little messages from each of our application servers going, hey, I'm on, I'm alive and you can send me the things. I'm, I'm good at processing the things, okay? On the server though, there may or may not be applications running. So the very first thing that starts up on our systems is not the uh, BGP router, it's actually our proxy server, HA proxy, and its job is to take the traffic that it's receiving from, from the upstream ISP router and decide where to send it. And it could send it locally, which is the best option for us. It's faster for the customer, it's cheaper for us, but it can also decide to send it to um, another server or even another continent if stuff has gone horribly wrong, okay? And proxy servers are great for that. There is one limitation, and I'll touch on that later. So, outside world, just recapping, Anycast, DNS, health check failovers, down to a region, um, uh, ISP server running, or ISP infrastructure running BGP, and now we're on, down to a single server running HA proxy, shipping stuff out to, to various jails. Um, I mentioned separation points, where it's a good place to draw a line, and the very first versions of this used, um, let me think now, what do we use? Auto SSH tunnels, which I guess was the thing we knew at the time, but it's not really designed for long-term stable connections. Something like IPsec at the time probably would have been better. Um, and what we've done is we've moved everything over to a, a mesh VPN. It's called zero tier. These days, probably people would pick WireGuard, but the general concept is the same. The, the mesh magically knows how to find the closest servers. And if one of the links is down, it will magically route around it. And this really does work. Um, at the time, we got extensive testing with DigitalOcean. They're in the middle of consolidating their um, BGP routes globally. And every few days, um, our mesh at the time would break. And once we switched over to using zero tier, that just disappeared completely. We'd notice patches where it slows down, uh, but traffic never really got lost. And I guess in, we've been doing that now for six years. That's pretty cool, yeah. So. I like networking if it doesn't get in my way. And a big thanks to Equinix, who are the group that got me on to using BGP in the first place, and also Peter Hessler, whose uh, training course to me suggested that it must be really easy, so I should have a go. Okay, um, I don't want to give whole config files because it's too much, so this isn't all of our BGP config, but that's all we actually need. So clearly we're not a networking company, we're not running large enterprise networks. All we need to do is announce um, one local IP is being reachable and we send that to, from our perspective, one upstream ISP router. It's probably some sort of magical cluster and, and that's all we need to do. Yeah, so pretty straightforward. So next up, looking at a little bit more detail, the load balancer. Um, this is HA proxy mainly because um, at the time I had a choice between Nginx Plus, which had the health check functionality built in um, at, a, at a price or HA proxy, which had open source built in, and it was free, and so that's the way we went. So sometimes the decisions we make have long-term consequences. Um, for HA proxy, what we're really interested in here is down the bottom, there's a few sections here, a few stanzas. I hope the font's big enough to read. So this is a clustered database. There are three nodes in a cluster, and traffic is distributed across them. I've removed from this template the logic that makes sure that you go to the closest, physically closest server, because it just gets too confusing. Um, but the order here is varied between servers. So if you're um, in the US, you'll get sent to the CO2 server rather than the CO1. If you're in Europe, you get CO1 rather than CO2. And if you're in Asia, 
you get the CO3 server first, okay? If that server's not responding, um, HA proxy will wait for a few seconds and then send the traffic somewhere else. What's important is it doesn't just wait, but it holds the customer connections open. So data is coming in from the customer and we're waiting and waiting and waiting for HA proxy to decide whether, oh crap, it's down, I'm just gonna go over here, yep. And that time actually is significant. We don't have these failures very often, um, but if we're doing maintenance, we can plan around that. So if we're doing maintenance, we take the um, server out of the load balancer configuration, traffic is drained, and then it goes to the other servers seamlessly. So this is only if we have an operational failure. Low balance, oh, one thing I forgot to mention. For HA proxy, it's got tremendous Lua integration. It's not super well documented, but you can do all sorts of things. You can um, call external services to get status. So for example, querying uh, one of our other systems to know what jails are up, what applications are running well or not. And you can send, you can change the state of HA proxy using these Lua scripts. Uh, it's really, really awesome. So load balancers have two sides. This is the other half of it, the front end now. So we've looked at the back end, how the magic plumbing gets established and sending traffic over our mesh VPN. And on the top here, we're now looking at the front end. It's a very, very simple, um, this is an HTTP based application, very, very simple. Um, we bind to an IP and a port and we add a couple of headers along the way before sending it to the back end. What's important about the front end is that this is the thing, the separation of concerns. Our applications don't know about the magical mesh VPN. They don't know about the clusters and they don't know about the nodes that may or may not be adjacent. All they send it to is this local port, this couch FE, the front end that's closest to them. So it's very, very simple for the application to manage. And from a testing perspective, it means we can do our application testing and our infrastructure testing separated. Okay, so it's another separation point. So red slide, any questions? No, cool, okay, so onwards. Now we're talking about the jails. So we've gone from the outside, from the networking, we've gone quickly through the load balancer and we've come out the other side and we're talking to some sort of application, the jails. So this is the first piece where we run into a little problem. How do I find the jails? How do I know what jails are up and running? With the load balancer, when the load balancer is running, I talked about this convergence time, it takes a few seconds for the load balancer to decide that the traffic isn't being responded to fast enough. It has to wait in case it does get a response, but after a certain number of seconds, it goes, you're definitely dead, I'm, I'm not gonna get a response. And that could be up to six seconds sometimes, that's quite a long time. If we could get the state of the jails directly, then we would know um, like five milliseconds later that jail is not there, there's no point sending traffic there and we could trim probably five seconds off our convergence time. So that's pretty significant. Um, and to do that, um, we could add 20 million lines of Kubernetes or we could add 20 lines of shell. Yeah, so a recurrent theme in this talk is what would happen if I didn't do the obvious thing and found a dirty solution? And uh, this is pretty dirty. Um, those of you who know FreeBSD jails pretty well will know that this is the output on the right of the um, jails status call. Tell me the jails that are running. And I don't do any massaging of it or any updates. I just pipe that out of a netcat to um, the socket. And we just run this in a loop. Um, and you can, you can do like a thousand requests a second to this. So in my books, that's a pretty good API yeah, for, for not much work. Um, the only catch here is there's no metadata and it's a read-only API, not a, um, uh, not a writable one. So we can't use this to create jails or change the state of jails or add metadata to them, but at least we know they're there, okay? And with a little bit of Lua plumbing and HA proxy, that's all we need to knock five seconds off our convergence time when jails are unexpectedly disappearing. The other advantage of this little hack is that this is also available over the network. So with FreeBSD jails, you only can find out about the state of the jails on your local machine. But with this change now, our HA proxy node can get the state of jails on any other server in, in the network. Okay, nice little hack. So we're out of the low balancer world now, and now we're looking at applications. 
So this is the first place where we're really starting to look at immutability and going, what can we get rid of? Um, how can we simplify this? How can we take away the things to break? And um, over the course of the last few years, uh, we've tested two web servers, um, because web servers are not very exciting, um, eight databases, um, and many customer applications. And I'm just going to see if I can see my speaker notes so I can tell you what those were. Cool, now we have speaker notes. Um, so first up, web servers. Um, H2O, which is at the time was a uh, leading web server used for um, providing HTTP2, and now that's stopped being a project that has regular tarball releases, but has become a rolling release. It's what Fastly uses inside their CDN. Um, we have it in FreeBSD ports, it's pretty nice. Um, and Nginx, which everybody knows and loves uh, around the world. Okay, so what happens here is we prepare a jail, um, we use ZFS, um, we make it read-only, we write a small number of config files in user local etc slash app, um, we set the entire data set to read-only, um, for, for the web servers, we nullfs mount um, the static data into the jail. Um, we leave the TLS termination to external HA proxy, and the reason for that is again, there's now no secrets in the jail. Um, we use Unix domain sockets, so the jail has no secrets, no networking, um, and it's read-only, apart from a small number of directories. And for those directories, we make them set UID no and um, exec no as well. Um, so again, reducing that attack service. The one thing remaining is logging, and uh, logging in general is pretty straightforward. We have two choices. We can mount a Unix domain socket inside the jail, um, or better, we can use syslog-ng running somewhere else and have the jail send its, sorry, have the application send its data over syslog. In some cases that's possible, so for Nginx that's straightforward, and for H2O it's not, and the hack we found for H2O is that we pipe the logs to logger, um, which is a FreeBSD tool, and Logger sends that stuff over the network. Um, and that's one less thing that the, the attacker can do. There's now no, no way for them to tamper with the logs from the moment they gain access to the server. Um, everything is logged until they realize that they're being logged and they kill off the logging dean or something. Yeah, okay. So that's the first piece. Um, for web servers, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and if we can't use this log, we pipe standard error, standard out to a tool that can and fall it off. There's no networking, so there's no lateral movement, uh, and that's really important from a security perspective. If some, one application is compromised, you don't want them to hop to something that's even more vulnerable into your database, um, into your private stash of MP3s, everything like that. Don't want that to happen. Um, we've got no secrets in the jail. Um, and also they're unable to tamper with backups because we've nullifs mounted our web server data into the jail, it's read-only, and we can do the backups um, outside. Um, from a daemon perspective, we've got no cron, no syslog, no NTP, no other daemons, and no processes running as root. Uh, so that's another thing we can monitor. If root processes appear in this jail, things are going very wrong, and we should sound the alarm bells. Okay. Databases, much trickier. So we share all the same tricks as before, Unix sockets, syslog, softlinks, but databases typically have different storage requirements. They'll have um, uh, your typical database tables. They will need to be writable. They will need to be backed up. They will need to be on fast storage. Um, we will also have um, indexes, um, materialized views, fast, but we don't want to back them up. And we may also have um, a write ahead log, which may even need to be on physically different storage. It may need to be on a, um, like a Zill or a Slog or something like that. Um, so for those, um, the database is also pretty opinionated. They have to be like this, and they have to go in these directories, and no, you can't change them. So how we deal with this, similar to way that the way we deal with the, the web servers, we modify the config files as much as possible, um, we set up a separate ZFS data set, and we can control the mount point for those. So when the server insists on a particular layout for its directories, we use um, FreeBSD mounts to put these in the right places. 
Each data set has configurable properties, so that means we can set uh, record size, um, metadata performance, caching, um, throughput or latency, all of those things individually per data set for the applications themselves. Um, once we've done that, the overall picture is read-only data set as usual, var db thing writable with configurable properties for performance, and then we run the database. And inevitably the first time it crashes, so we have to look for logs, um, we have to look for errors, we figure out is this something that we can move so we can take uh, the place that the database wants to write to, sometimes it's in var run or var log, put that somewhere else, uh, or do we need to create another data set um, again to do that? Um, yeah, and so finally, the ZFS snapshots we take, why we're doing the backups, sorry, why, why we're running the server, can be accessed from outside, um, outside the server, outside the jail, and we can do our backups on these um, point in time snapshots and when those are completed, we can either retire the snapshot, uh, but we don't need to interrupt the application. That's a really, really nice, um, really, really nice feature. So, apologies for the small font, but we, we do need it, just, just this once. Can anyone read that at all? Okay, that's all right, that's a win. Um, I wasn't sure what room I was gonna get, so I didn't know what was gonna happen. So what we're gonna look at here is, this is not a ZFS talk, but this is the key piece we need to take away. There's a column here called mounted, I think everyone here knows what that means. There's a column here called can mount, and you probably know what that means. It means if the operating system asks, you are allowed to mount it. Um, it's not the same thing as whether it is mounted or not. Okay, so mounted, it's mounted. Can mount, if you ask for it to be mounted, you're allowed to do so. Um, it can also be set to no auto, and we'll see that on a subsequent slide. And then the final column, jailed. So what we have here is, our Z pool called Z root. Um, we have a, a container or parent um, data set called slash jailed, and every data set under here is going to have mutable, writable um, state for our databases. This is where the goodies are, the important stuff, the data we care about. And you can see I've got, I don't even know how to pronounce that, HedgeDoc, Postgres, SoftServe, and um, Sync. So that's like, what's that, five, five jails. Each of these has its own storage. And you can see on the far right, the mount point column. Um, these are mount points inside the jail, not outside the jail. So they're not visible in the root file system of our normal server under vardb thing. They're only visible inside the jail, okay? So this is our storage being mounted inside the jail. And then the next, back to the name column, you've got about halfway down, you'll see there's another sort of parent data set called jails, and this is, our, this is our immutable store. And so the way we've done this is we create a download directory and a download data set, and it's literally the tarballs. Um, they can be the FreeBSD tarballs if we're just using source, or if we're building our own versions of FreeBSD with packages embedded in them, they can be our own tarballs there, custom tarballs, and then in Right down the bottom, you'll see templates. We've only got one template here, and that's a ZFS data set. All the files unpacked from our tarball, just like a normal directory tree, and we make any tweaks we want to there. So if we're using tools like Ansible or Chef, that might be the place where you add custom configurations. That template is gonna be reused across all of our jails. And so that's what we've done here. We've cloned one for HedgeDoc, one for Invidious, one for Merengovia, one for Sync, and one for www, and each of these then is sharing the same parent data set, which means we're only caching in memory one, uh, one ZFS data set. So it's a huge win there. Um, and all of those are read-only, okay? So that's it. The jail slash instances um, data sets are completely replaceable. They're all read-only, and the way we want to manage this is, is um, cattle, not pets, um, we can remove all of those jails and we will keep our jailed data set, okay? Does that make sense? That's really important. Jailed, the stuff we want to keep. Jails, the stuff we can trash at any time and replace automatically. Yeah, so we can erase them, replace them, 
um, with a with a, with a new uh, with a new tarball, unpacked tarball, and then just restart the jail, and it'll automatically reattach its uh, its database, its writable directories, and if we've set that up correctly, then it'll just run happily on the new version. So. This is looking at a slightly different example. This is a little bit more ZFS magic. So the problem we now have is we have um, a complicated application. We're going to put it all in one jail, and we need to separate out the different types of storage into data sets, and we want them all to be auto-mounted um, by the operating system for us. So what we have here is we have um, var db, which is it's going to be mounted in var db in the jail, Z root jailed gray log. And under it, it's got three child data sets. Each one of these has different settings because they want different block sizes. Um, the uh, open search one is this enormous pig of a database. So it has extra storage and we turn caching off it. And the other two, gray log and MongoDB, are configured, um, configuration databases. So they're nice and fast. And we want all of them cached. So they have different settings. And in the jail configuration, it's actually a single line. We say to ZFS, just mount um, zroot jailed graylog db, and it does mount that, and it notices, the mount script notices that it's got three child data sets, and those are auto-mounted, okay? And that's how we get different storage classes in different locations um, for our databases in the same jail. So down the bottom, our application's been running, and um, there's lots of interesting things in our logs here and we have these snapshots happening automatically. Now, as a general rule, we try not to do the backups inside the jails because that could be under attack and control, and then we would have no data and no backups, and ransomware would get us again, and we don't want that. So we do our backups from outside on the parent system, and in this case for ZFS, you do your normal thing of creating the snapshot um, and sending that out on a stream to whatever you want to do. Uh, Tarsnap, Restic, um, NFS, something fancy. And yeah, that's it for backups, pretty straightforward. Now, how do we figure this out? Um, the end result is relatively easy, but the process for figuring out it is painful. Install the B, the database, make everything read-only, start it up, see what crashes and fix it. Um, we watch it with snapshots, so we do a, be a before snapshot, then we run the database, we do an after snapshot, and we can ask ZFS, there's a tool called, um, a command called ZFS diff, and a bit like, um, conceptually, a bit like a normal diff, it shows you what's changed, it, but in, for ZFS's case, it only tells you that files have changed. It doesn't tell you what's in it, but you do know which files have changed. So you can use ZFS diff to find out where the database is writing that you, don't, that you didn't know about, okay? The very final piece is really important. After we've change the config files and put tables and logs into writable locations. We need to install some test data, destroy everything except these, um, the, this, this, this mutable data directories we have, redeploy the container, um, start the application, and dump the table again. So do a SHA-256 checksum, do a row count, and make certain that we haven't lost anything. Um, really, really important to do that. Okay. So, for making things immutable for applications, for jails, um, and also for the operating system, it's really the same, what is that, six, seven steps all the time. Change all the config files to put the writable stuff in the writable places. Um, use Unix sockets, soft links for things like temp, var, run, and anything else that applications think they want to write to. Move syslog to a network service if it's a jail. Um, use ZFS nested data sets to tune performance and, uh, well, in tuning, um, set of a stiff to find the mutable locations, and once we complete, the main data set goes ZFS read-only, and we can use no set UID, no exec, and similar tags on our mount, mounts for the writable locations to make it harder for attackers as well.
So, so um, Michael's question is, we've got three regions, how does the data um, replicate? And the answer is magic, magic, yeah? Um, so we have two main things. Um, some of the more modern applications are written, written with things called um, CRDTs, conflict-free replicated data types. And um, that's just a little bit of mathematics that says, if I have a certain number of items in a set, and I add another item to the set, can I do that in such a way that I can take any other set at a different point in time and have it order them in the correct way? That's what CRDTs do. There's a whole bunch of flavors of those, so you kind of like they're tunable. You can pick a different CRDT for a different situation. Modern applications, CRC, CRDTs were invented in around 2010, I think, so that's maybe that's sort of new for people. Um, but if you're writing your own application, you can choose that sort of algorithm, and then things will just catch up um, sort of really more or less instantly as soon as they receive the data. So the key thing about CRDTs is they are sets with special properties such that at a later point in time, you can combine the data you have, and it will always produce the same ordering, um, independent of time, independent of how you merge them. Um, and a good example, a really simple example of this is um, if you all agree to give me a sum of money at the end of the talk, it doesn't matter which order I receive the money in, I'll still get the same amount, which will be zero, right? We know it's going to be zero. Um, but the order doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I get five bucks and two bucks and seven bucks. It always comes out to the same sum. That doesn't work for subtraction. It doesn't work for division. And it doesn't work for a number of other operations. But it does work for multiplication. And it does work for... Um, addition, okay? So conflict-free, uh, sorry, conflict-free replicated data types, okay? So that's one. What do we do about the applications that don't use that? Um, and the short answer is I don't use those sort of applications. Um, <laughs> if you're writing your own apps, you get that choice. Um, it's much easier to do this with databases that support this natively, and it's much harder to do this with um, Postgres and things like that that do. You, always have the situation where you have a multi-master um, system, you're writing to, um, to secondary nodes, and you have to have some algorithm that tries to fail over. So, um, a little digression. I used to work um, at HP for, in, in, in storage, and the amount of money that people will spend to make an application that was never designed to be resilient to failure on hardware is unbelievable, 10, 100 times what they paid to develop the application in the first place. And it's much, much cheaper to make the application work correctly in the case of failure to try and work around it with hardware. Uh, and you will always lose data with the hardware scenario. You'll always lose data because the application doesn't know that there's a lag between the production node and the secondary, and it doesn't know how to handle the case where the production node has begun the write, the secondary nodes have received it and written it to storage, but haven't acknowledged the primary, which then crashed. And the application doesn't know how to resolve that, and that's why we use CRDTs, because CRDTs fix that problem. The three nodes start up again, and they go, I've got something you don't have, and they know how to resolve that. Yeah. So hopefully that's a useful digression. Magic. Magical maths. So deploying containers onwards. So... Um, what is a webhook? A webhook is, I don't know how webhooks are now, but it's basically what would happen if between two servers I posted a little JSON blob to an endpoint that says, do the thing, make it so. And that's what a webhook is. And um, this is how uh, GitHub, GitLab, any of these sort of um, software um, repository tools do their continuous integration. You commit source code, when it's written to disk, they send a webhook to another part of their system, um, or maybe they use a message queue, and it just works for all of these in series. So for version one, back in 2016-ish, I guess, 2015, um, our deployment was shell scripts, SCP, reboots, hopefully customers won't notice. It's 2015, you know, who cares? Who cared back then? It wasn't important. And for version two, we changed our internal applications, and we made them package compliant. So um, we can build them with package create. We'll look at that in a moment. And that meant to install a new version of our application with just package install. That's actually pretty quick and pretty easy. And it's 
it's atomic, and then we just restart that application or that jail. So at this stage, it's not immutable. We're able to just deploy new packages into our containers. They're clearly not immutable, but um, it was much simpler, much tidier, and we knew there was no half-finished deploys. There was no partially completed shell scripts. We either deployed the whole application or we didn't. The package is really good for that. Um, version three, we linked the git commit for the application and we kicked off our CI build, which is another fancy word for shell script. Um, and it would run, the, would run the build, run the tests, and if that was successful, it would run package create and we'd have this little tarball which we can then deploy our systems. So still not immutable, but um, yeah, deployment is pretty much automatic at this point, and it's about 30, 40 lines of shell script. So we're starting to get up towards Kubernetes, but we've got another 20 million lines of code to go. So a little bit of room to maneuver. Um, I, I do think that the shell scripts have their place. They're not friendly to junior sysadmins. They're not friendly to people who are just making occasional changes. Um, but they're a lot cheaper than doing a, a full-on uh, sort of Kubernetes-type deployment. Um, there's a great, if you're a large company, Kubernetes is amazing. There's really nothing like it, but you really need to have a dedicated team of people to look after it. And that's usually not the world I live in. Um, okay, so we've written some source code. We've pushed it. Um, the source code tool will generate an HMAC signed HTTP request. It'll get sent off, hits HA proxy. HA proxy does some basic validation, TLS, mutual TLS, did the did the webhook come from the people who said it came from? Um, they'll do some routing to decide where an, an infrastructure to send that. And um, then we use a tool which is literally called webhook. Uh, that's, that's at the top there. Um, it's in FreeBSD ports, and it's a lovely little Go program. And webhook checks that the HMAC is valid, and it runs as a lower privileged user. So there's no way for a privileged escalation to happen from the webhook user. It runs in, our, in a CI jail, and it builds a new package for us. When it's finished, um, it requests a package-based deploy, which is another way of saying um, it triggers another webhook, which runs Ansible with higher privileges, and all that Ansible tool does is just redeploys the jails, remove, recreate, and when it's recreated, it picks up the new version of package. Um, so we're now one step closer to our immutability stuff. Okay, so this deploy is automatic at this point and it has a reliance on the health check and the application being robust. So when the application starts up, it should be able to respond in some way that says my database is working and talking to me, I can log things to the right places, um, I've got enough CPU and memory, um, I don't know what else. And if it replies at that point that the health check is okay, Ansible will then re-add this server, this jail, back into the load balancing pool and wait until it settles. Then it'll remove the next jail from the application pool, wait for that to drain, and add the next one back in and repeat. So that process isn't quite that impotent. Um, it runs the first one, the second one, the third one until they're all done. So version four is to um, experiment with, with um, TarFS. So TarFS is a new feature which I think is in FreeBSD 14 release, or will be in 14 release, um, jointly done between uh, Juniper and, and Clara. And TarFS ex is exactly what you think it is. It's a tarball that you can mount. You don't need to unpack it, you don't need to unzip it. Um, it's clearly immutable, um, and it means we don't need ZFS if that's something that matters to you. So. We'll look at that later, it's pretty neat. Um, that's version four, and my hope with this is that um, I can put the entire application jail into a tarball inside package. So I can go package install containers slash foo version one, package install containers slash foo version two, and everything will be contained in that. Um, so I've done a little bit of private experimentation, I've got something that works, but is not pretty, um, it's not suitable for, for, for committing yet, but the general idea looks pretty promising. So we'll look at that later. Next up, so this is how the webhooks look from uh, a sysadmin perspective. Um, which one is this here? 
oh yeah, this is the GitHub uh, webhook. So it's pretty straightforward. It's the sort of thing you can see yourself setting up in, in like 10, 15 minutes. Um, it knows what command it needs to run, so there's an execute command there. Um, it changes the directory, and then it extracts from the JSON blob it's received from the upstream service a bunch of things which are put into um, into um, command line, uh, no, so into, into environment variables. Now, the only thing we have to be mindful here of is that these variables are now under the control of the remote service, which might be hacked. So a classic way to attack an organization today is to um, get malware onto a developer's laptop, hack the CI, get into production, win everything. So we have to bear in mind that those values are untrusted, okay? Um, but we don't deal with that here. That's not the webhooks problem. And on the right, we've got a bunch of trigger hooks. Um, the HMAC has to match, and um, it has to have a signature from GitHub, um, and there has to be, on the bottom right here, it says match type value, value is refs heads main. That's a fancy way of saying that the git um, branch this commit landed on was main. So we only run this webhook if you did a commit and it landed on main, okay? So you can do private builds on um, dev branches and they won't go through this process. Um, okay, so version one did all of this with webhooks and shell scripts, no external dependencies, and it's very, very debuggable if you need to. You jump into a jail, you run this command in the foreground, you change the include command output in response to true, and you can just watch it happening. Um, and version two, I switched to using a hosted tool called BillKite for some of this. We get very, very nice graphs, um, but I don't think it's less work um, or necessarily easy to understand. Maybe in a year's time I'll have a, a more refined opinion, um, but it's definitely less tooling on our side. Um, so a bonus is an arbitrary playbook via Ansible, uh, sorry, but via webhook to Ansible, and I just thought, hey, what can we use this stuff for? And the answer is everything. Um, so now if you know the secret HMAC um, signing key, you can post from anywhere in the world to our infrastructure and say, run this playbook. And the main reason for doing that was we had um, people traveling like myself or um, devs in and other locations without good network connectivity. And if the playbook takes 15 minutes to run because um, you're in Hyderabad, that's really frustrating when the power goes out and you don't know what the state of stuff is. And with this way, you post the webhook, um, you can tailor logs, and it runs on our own infrastructure. So that's pretty neat. So package create. So the problem is we are FreeBSD people and we like to put things in ports trees and we like make files. And that's the way we do it. And we build packages without network access because that's the right thing to do. Um, and we like the results of that build to be the same every single time. Unfortunately, not all the software we write, the tools we use, particularly the JavaScript, um, no, no JS tools, don't really work very well like this or they're very difficult to use. And so instead, we use a feature of, uh, of the package tool called package create, which um, generates a package install compatible tarball, the same thing as the um, ports tree would produce, but um, where are we going here? Yeah, identical is what the ports tree produces, but we run it as a, as a script in a command line ourselves and not part of uh, the Puria build tool. So it takes a manifest, which is the thing you can see on the left here, and apart from my sort of humorous um, comments all the way through, you can see this is pretty straightforward. It's very, very much the same fields that we have in the make file and the ports tree. It's just they're in a UCL manifest. It also takes a directory of files and it bundles them up, allows us to modify the permissions, and just dumps that in a directory. Uh, and that's really, yeah, really nice. So we've experimented with using this for deploying TLS certs, signing keys, so things that are private. Um, instead of deploying those via Ansible, we can now put them in a private package repo and deploy them that way. Um, SSH pub keys, um, anything that doesn't really need versioning, but we don't want in a server golden image in case the image is leaked. So package create and package sign. For brevity, I omitted creating the package repo itself, but it's another two or three commands where you make an SSH 
Uh, so you make an RSA key, you make a public key, to, you make a public key for that, a public cert from that, sorry, and use these for signing. The first package create takes the manifest in our prepared staging directory, which is the same thing as you'd use in the ports tree, and makes an artifact, which is just a TXC file. Um, we copy it then into our CI directory, uh, sign it, and then a bit later on, on one of the remote servers, a webhook runs that says just upgrade the package in the jail, and that's it. I really like this, it's really tidy. It's fiddly to get the applications working the right way in the first place, but once that's done, um, we're good. I'm just gonna do a time check here. We are, we're out of time, yeah. Um, I'll skip through the next bit very quickly, very, very quickly. So app summary, immutable containerized apps, read-only ZFS clones, nullfs mounts, nested data sets, syslog to move things out of the jail, no more processes, and immutable deploys via webhook and package tools, and the load balances network make that invisible. So immutable servers, this is the next layer down the stack. Um, there's too much moving state and key locations to make the whole system read-only. For people who are running appliances, um, building things like routers and that sort of world, I think it's much more manageable because you have a great deal of control. But in my world, we run too many applications that need things in certain places and we can't easily compile them and move around. Um, and you start to make things so bespoke that it becomes more effort to manage when another person starts and having something that's a more traditional server layout. So, um, ZFS boot environments, I'm just gonna skip this entirely in the interest of time. Um, the key thing here is we have a ZFS data set for the entire root file system. We can version it, we can mount it, um, we can snapshot it, and we can even send it from server to server as a golden image. Um, and when we want to, we can reboot. If the reboot fails, we can reboot again. The boot environment is rolled back to the original version, and we're back at the beginning. Okay. So Pudura is a build tool um, that we use to build all the packages in FreeBSD, and we can also use it to build custom FreeBSD images. Uh, we can build it with the FreeBSD source that we want, we can include the ports we want, and we can even include an overlay directory, which is the custom files that get dropped into it. Um, and the output could be memstick, ISO, ZFS dataset, or even a tarball. So I mentioned tarfs earlier. Um, you can see here how we can reuse that again for our jails here. And for input, uh, we covered that already. Git source tree and overlay directories. So my experience here is that the less you put in your, um, in the overlay, the better. It's much better to put those things into packages and have them pulled in that way. So we have some custom loader.conf settings, um, FS tab to make sure we have a tempfs um, on boot. Um, SSHD is good, we want it on, we want a custom resolver, a tool called SyncBE, which we're going to talk about next, and our custom package repo if we need it, and a list of packages we need to build. So we run Pudria, um jail, it builds our jail from scratch, from source. This one's using Relang 13.2, uh, I guess in a week or so, or a couple of weeks, we'll change that to 14.0. It's building it from Git over HTTPS, and this could be your custom Git repository, or it could be the FreeBSD one here, and we want a generic kernel. So that produces a, a Pudria jail, which is effectively a, a, a vanilla FreeBSD server. Um, after that, we use Pudria to build a bunch of packages, and that's just a file with a list um, of the category slash port name, okay? So at the end of this, we have the packages we want, we have the operating system we want, and we can build an image that contains those two things plus the overlay directory set on the bottom. There's a couple of parameters of interest in here in the middle. Dash S swap, host name of none. Um, we want an hour O for output. Where are we gonna put this? This is our web server directory so that we can fetch this image later on. And right at the top, you'll see this image dash T, what is that, ZFS plus send plus BE. Um, there's about 10 options for the dash type parameter. But the one we want is make me a ZFS data set that's going to be a boot environment um, that I can send to, okay? So going back to ZFS, we're going to take this image off our web server, stream it in, unpack it, and then a little bit of tweaking and reboot around our new server. So this is the dream 
we now have a, an immutable image that we can build through CI, that we can deploy to any server, and we've just got a small bit of customization data to do it across. So, whew. no questions, no loud now. So we're almost at the end here. This is the culmination of this build process, and this is just two slides, pretty straightforward. The BUCTL command lists the active boot environments. Um, in this case, this system just has two, the default one, and I guess that was a preceding version for patching. Um, what is that? 13.1 release. Yeah. We're then going to fetch our package image that we made, um, the ZFS data stream, and we're going to pipe that in without doing any checksum checking for the sake of simplicity on the slide. And then we're going to pipe that into the sync BE tool from, from Clara, from um, um, Rob Wing, and we give it the new boot name environment we want. We want a 13.2 release boot environment, and we pass it a config file, which we'll look at shortly. And you can see here, it receives the ZFS stream, it's unpacked it, and it took like 35 seconds, which is pretty fast for a full server deploy. That's pretty awesome, really. Um, this script isn't finished, but we need to have it on the second slide. Uh, sorry, next slide, this is what we want. Sync BE. Here we go, here's the last piece of it here. So the main catch with Sync BE is you can see here the ZFS data set's been streamed in, but it's the same for every single server. Host name, SSH, keys, um, certificates, all of these things should be unique per server, but aren't in our template image. And Sync BE is just a little script with some error checking that says copy these files from the current server that's running. Okay? So it copies them in, and at the end, um, we reboot. So my main takeaway is we tried to go for the appliance mode where we changed the configuration files in FreeBSD, which is easy to do, but it made life confusing for people who had to maintain it. And SyncBE with ZFS datasets is much more natural, and it's really easy for people to understand, oh, this script, we need to maintain the list of things that need to be copied in. Um, it's not ideal, but uh, it's, it's good enough. So last but not least, TireFS, and then we're done. So TireFS, as I said from Clara and Juniper, um, allows us to mount a tarball as a read-only file system. We can apply jails, nullifs mounts, all of those things that we're used to into this as well. It's coming in 14 data release. It may not be as fast as, as other file systems yet, but I'm sure that will come. It only supports plain tarball, not gzip, not gz, not xz, but it does support ZFS, I'm sorry, Z standard compression. And um, it's so simple, <laughs> that's really all there is to it. We take our release tarball, unpack it to a tar, take the compressed tarball, unpack it, um, mount with tarfs, mount a devfs and a tempfs, so we have somewhere writable, um, create the jail, and on the next slide, we should see some stuff happening in there. Um, we're not allowed to make a directory. The error that comes back is a little weird. Um, but we can see that our temporary file systems and our DevFS are there. And it's a lovely read-only thing. So in closing, this is where I'd like to be next year to have our applications deployed as tarballs via package. And our jails would just be restart jail. And there, I think I'd be pretty happy with that. OK. Um, Thank you. Thanks for hanging on a little bit longer. We, we lost a bit of time with setup in the beginning. So, Malik, questions? Maybe that's an array of just two. Uh, any questions before we roll for the day? Doran. You said you didn't use any compression, but you said you Why not? So, in the example, I don't use any compression. So, th the question was, we don't use compression for tarfs. So in this specific example, I don't. Um, but if I'd use Z standard compression, I could. Um, that's not really a question I can answer why Z standard versus some other ones. But I guess it's about addressing content and blocks inside a compressed file system and finding them easily. Yeah. Don't know if that answers the question enough. Anything else? Great, okay, we'll, we'll free the pointer to Dave, and I am advised going to the social. Uh, please excuse my bad puns. Yeah. <laughs>